this talk will be maybe slightly different from what you're used to. Uh, uh, you're all academics. Uh, um, uh, the private sector uh, R&D works uh, um, in somewhat <coughs> different ways. So we're more like, I would say, market driven. So you know, we seek for an answer needs uh, in the market, uh, in particular biomedicine, uh, us. And then we try to provide solution to that. And your job is actually to tell us what the needs are. So your research is fundamental for our work. So keep doing what you're doing for sure. And uh, I will just briefly introduce uh, Exigon, which is actually still a, a small medium enterprise. So we're not a lot of people. We're about 100 people. And uh, we're located here, uh, north of Copenhagen. Uh, this is where uh, you know, R&D, manufacturing, uh, um, headquarter, uh, uh, production uh, services is located and where the majority of people is employed. Then we have a subsidiary in the US, uh, it's Axigon Incorporated, uh, uh, located uh, near Boston, that is mainly dealing with the North American market. And then we have uh, several distributors around the world. I don't think actually this map is completely updated though, because so, we have some new ones. Uh, in Italy, we are distributed exclusively by Euroclone, which is uh, that guy over there, as, uh, our main contact. And, um, our company was basically founded uh, uh, in 1996 um, around uh, core technology, which is called LNA, uh, which, uh, which stands for lock nucleic acids, which I'll describe uh, in the next few slides. And really, we have two main business divisions. One is Hexagon Life Sciences, which is about 90% of the company. And we use the LNA technology to develop products for uh, uh, helping you uh, study RNA. Um, um, using, uh, for instance, this technology, and also we have services uh, if you want us to do uh, certain type of experiments, uh, mainly genomics. And then we have a segment called Exigon Diagnostic in which we use the products that we invent here for uh, biomarker discovery projects, uh, aiming at uh, trying to uh, see whether microRNAs can be useful for uh, diagnostic tools in a number of different uh, disease areas, uh, mainly focusing on cancer right now. I will describe briefly um, a couple of our uh, most uh, interesting, I think, uh, projects uh, in, in the next few slides. And it's really nice because uh, what we learn from the diagnostic also, so applying our products to real life, actually helps us constantly to upgrade our products. Uh, so it's a nice interrelationship that we have with, between these two uh, departments. It kind of like keeps us in reality uh, check all the time. So what I was planning to, to present is a lot of stuff, but I'm going to try to go through some, some things very quickly uh, to fit in in one hour. So it will be uh, an overview on our technology and uh, some background, very simple background information on microRNAs. Then uh, um, how we use our uh, qPCR, LNA-based qPCR uh, platform uh, in, uh, in, uh, in diagnostics, so some general uh, unanswered questions and issues. Then uh, two of our uh, latest uh, um, advancement in uh, this is unpublished data. Uh, this is fairly new. It's also unfinished. So, um, but I, I thought it was interesting to show you know, how we do it um, at Exigon. So this is mainly early detection of colorectal cancer, uh, which probably some of you uh, might, might have heard this story, um, but it's finishing up this year. This is very new, very exciting. It's urine-based, uh, looking at exosomes for, for uh, detection of prostate cancer. And then I will completely switch uh, topics and uh, go into um, tools to, uh, for anti-sense knockdown of RNA molecules in vivo. So uh, this is uh, more like in preparation of a, of a new field that is advancing, which is the RNA therapeutics field, uh, how to uh, basically uh, find novel drug targets in vivo um, in animals. So quickly, uh, what I'm kind of obsessed with microRNAs. I've been uh, studying them for many years. And uh, the reason for that is that they, they hold a huge potential, I believe, in, in you know, discovering basic mechanism of biology, but also like their practical application as, as uh, uh, potential uh, biomarkers and drugs, drug targets, or drug themselves. So uh, quick facts about microRNAs. It are short non-coding RNA molecules that are endogenously transcribed. They're usually 19 to 22 nucleotides long. They're processed from a very long transit uh, in uh, uh, stepwise uh, processing steps. And their function is uh, uh, to inhibit post-transcriptionally 
target mRNAs. Um, it was believed uh, that uh, microRNAs mainly bind to 3' UTR messenger RNAs, but then now the revised knowledge is that microRNAs can actually bind all over the messenger RNA. And uh, um, the way they um, inhibit uh, um, uh, translation of uh, messenger RNAs is mainly uh, uh, by uh, circularizing the, the RNA and uh, basically preventing uh, uh, the ribosome machine, machinery to actually start reading through the, uh, the RNA. Um, so, it's, so it's mainly uh, um, uh, translational repression, but then a, a consequence of that is, is always, almost always, uh, decay of this mRNA. So eventually this mRNA will simply be degraded, because of course uh, an mRNA that is not translated is useless inside the cell. Um, so th this is the current model how, how microRNAs uh, act um, as repressing targets. Um, they regulate at least a third, but now the consensus is like more like 50% or even more of, of, of all human genes. So they have a huge impact on, on, on cellular homeostasis, uh, um, uh, in particular gene expression, of course. There are many uh, annotated human microRNAs, um, although I would say um, there's a new release of this, this is the official microRNA database, it's called MirBase. And uh, the newest release, which was a few months ago, actually was saying that uh, out of these 2,588 annotated human microRNAs, actually probably only 500 or so are relevant at all. So, uh, the others are expressed at very low levels in, uh, in, uh, in uh, few tissues. Uh, but still, um, a decent number of, of molecules, but not the tens of thousands that you will find with mRNAs. They're generally uh, phylogenetically well conserved. Um, at least a couple of hundreds of them are conserved from worms up until us. And since they're so intimately connected to uh, the normal cellular processes, uh, their alteration have, uh, of course, uh, very important roles in, in uh, um, uh, pathophysiology of a lot of uh, different diseases. Actually, it's virtually any disease uh, um, analyzed so far. And so uh, the role, as I said, is, uh, is key in, uh, in uh, both development and, and tissue differentiation in, the, in, in adults, uh, and therefore they have a huge impact in, uh, in, uh, in uh, pathology. Um, an interesting fact uh, about them, and that's, that's why we, we really want to study them um, as, a potential, as potential biomarkers, is that they're actively secreted uh, in, into the circulation. I will spend a few more words uh, later on on this, uh, it's not really clear exactly which cell type is actually uh, releasing them to the circulation, uh, uh, but the consensus is that like uh, some sort of like hormone-like uh, molecules uh, uh, inside the circulation. So they transmit a message from a, from a source cell to, to a target cell, uh, sort of like a signaling molecule, classical signaling molecule. They're very, very stable. Uh, so we profiled uh, formalin fix paraffin embedded material, like blocks uh, in hospital that, that were sitting there for uh, 35, 40 years at room temperature. And we can actually profile still uh, hundreds of micronase in them. So they're very, very stable. And this is because they're just so small. And perhaps they're also protected in some ways. And then they're so interested because, uh, as I mentioned, they're actively circulated, uh, uh, circulating in the circulation. So uh, you know, if you want to uh, measure microRNAs uh, in, in a patient, you just take some blood, and, uh, and these microRNAs are, are actually uh, very stable to allow you to actually measure them uh, in, in, in the circulation. And that's an ideal, of course, uh, um, um, specimen, because uh, it's, it's very minimally invasive, and uh, every hospital really uh, takes blood for any type of disease on any patient. So there are biobanks of uh, uh, tens of thousands of samples around the world. Another interesting uh, fact about them is that uh, as opposed to profiling many mRNAs and then you need, uh, you know, bioinformatician, uh, lots of statistical power and, and computing abilities, uh, actually these are a small number of genes to profile. So you can obtain, uh, you know, similar information so we actually not having to scratch your head too much and doing a lot of statistics. This is particularly useful for multiple classes like, you know, next generation sequencing, microarrays and qPCR. Another great property is that they're uh, um, highly quantifiable, at least with the, if you have the right platform to do it, and, uh, which we believe we have. And uh, um, you know, some cells express zero molecules. Uh, some other cells express uh, tens of thousands of molecules. Uh, uh, they're very tissue specific. Uh, so this is a very important property when you're looking for a possible biomarker. 
you know, this is this is great. Micronase are great, but then of course it, they're not the easiest molecule to uh, to to try to detect. Uh, first of all, because they're short, uh, so you basically don't have any flexibility if you're trying to design probes or uh, pri primers against them. Uh, you're stuck with their length, which is 20 nucleotides roughly, and so it's very hard to achieve sensitivity in, uh, in these type of issues. They're very diverse uh, molecules. Uh, these uh, 2,588 micronases are being characterized in humans. Uh, they have from 5 to 95% of GC content, so they're very different sequences. And when you have uh, you know, no flexibility of designing uh, primers, it's very hard to, to achieve specificities. And lots of family, mi micronases are uh, collected in families. Uh, uh, LET7 is a very famous uh, micronase family. It's about 30 members, and they only differ by a single nucleotide. Uh, so, uh, again, achieving specificity, it's, uh, it's really tough. Um, and then, uh, in particular, in the circulation, they're very rare targets. So sometimes, uh, you know, the 50 molecules to detect uh, in a huge volume. Uh, so again, uh, achieving high sensitivity is an issue. And the way we basically got around this, uh, uh, we were lucky to get a hold of this, this powerful chemistry, which was called, uh, uh, as I said, lock nucleic acid. And this is really like, uh, it looks simple, but it's not, but it's, uh, it's, it's basically a LNA, is an RNA molecule in which the, the ribose ring, which is this, the sugar ring of the, on the nucleic bas uh, acid uh, molecule has been locked, literally, uh, into the most stable conformation by this methylene bridge. So this bridge here freezes this, this molecule in the most stable conformation so that the result is that it binds uh, to complementary targets with a much higher affinity. And uh, other than that, you know, this is a molecule that can be used, uh, you know, it obeys Watson and Crick based pairing rules. Uh, it can be synthesized uh, uh, in any, uh, you know, uh, lab that has oligosynthesis capabilities. But really the power is that uh, on top of increasing uh, uh, the binding strength to complementary targets is that uh, this molecule becomes very resistant to enzymatic degradation as such, just by, by this mod modification, because this red residue here is actually not attackable anymore by, uh, by nucleases. And then uh, it's very useful, and I'll show you uh, how uh, in, uh, in uh, hybridization type of assays. For example, let's, let's assume that uh, uh, in here you're looking at a DNA oligo that is it's being used as a probe to target, uh, to detect, say, a microRNA that has a complementary sequence that is up here. So this probe has a melting temperature of 40 th 47 degrees. Melting temperature means that it's, it's a, a measure of the affinity of this probe towards, uh, towards a potential target. 47 is actually pretty low. So the way we increase this uh, melting temperature, therefore the affinity of these oligos, without increasing the length, which you can't, because your target is 20 nucleotides long, so you can't increase the length, is actually we substitute normal DNA bases with LNAs, and by putting more and more and more, we can actually increase the melting temperature, therefore the affinity of this probe enormously. Uh, double it, uh, we can even go higher, although you don't want to go too high, otherwise it will bind us specifically to other molecules. Another trick that we can do, we can actually make this molecule very short, maintaining a very high affinity uh, towards this target. These molecules are very uh, useful if you want to do mismatch discrimination. So for example, uh, um, if you want to um, basically detect an oligo that is different only uh, uh, by this, uh, uh, this A here, your mismatch, delta mismatch uh, temperature is only 3.7. By putting an LNA in this position, in the mismatch, mismatch position, a single LNA, you can actually almost uh, you know, triple it, uh, double it at least. So very useful also to uh, specifically detect uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms. And uh, you know, this technology has been used over the, over the years for uh, uh, many, many applications, uh, publications in science, cell, nature, uh, on, of any form, on any, any model organisms. Uh, uh, I, I wanted to show you a uh, few pictures. Uh, this is, for example, a whole mount uh, in situ hybridization of a uh, zebrafish liver using microRNA 122, which is absolutely specific for, uh, for liver cells. This was published by uh, Plasterk Lab in the Netherlands. And as you can see, you know, they try different chemistries to enhance um, affinity towards uh, this microRNA, but none of them could actually do it, do the job, you know, detect this microRNA that is only expressed in the liver. Only LNA could. 
And this is another uh, interesting uh, um, whole mount. Uh, I think these are cheek embryos actually from, uh, uh, from um, the Muesenberg uh, lab in, uh, in um, uh, East Anglia uh, University and uh, detecting uh, two micronase uh, that are present in skeletal muscle, micronase 1 and 206, which are uh, different only by this, these four nucleotides. But they have a very distinct uh, expression pattern. And so you can see here, micronase 1 and micronase uh, 206, uh, although they're uh, almost identical in sequence, but by using LNAs, you can actually discriminate exactly uh, their, their, their location, uh, cellular location, uh, by in situ hybridization. And in particular, this, this LNA technology has been very useful when designing uh, multiplex hybridization assays, such as a microarray, for example, for micronase. And in here, uh, what I'm showing is basically the range of melting temperature for all human micronase. As you can see, it's very diverse. Um, follows a, a bell curve, uh, and you find micronase with very uh, low TM, uh, meaning with a lot of ATs, and so very hard to detect, and micronase with very high uh, GC content. And then if you, if you want to design really like a microarray with lots of probes to detect all these micronase uh, at the same time, actually you face a lot of challenges, because usually the abridization temperature is around 60, 64 degrees, but then you will have probes that bind very poorly to the low T, uh, TM micronase, and that they bind, uh, you know, to totally specific to uh, t micronase that have a very high TM. So the way we, we get around this, uh, we TM normalize all the probes in a microarray. So we design them by positioning the RNAs in, in, uh, in positions that we know, um, uh, you know, produce the desired effect. Um, we um, make hybridization conditions more stringent and the TM of these probes follow in this temperature. And that means that we can detect, you know, all human micronase on a microarray type platform, for example, with the same affinity and specificity regardless of the target sequence. So this is an experiment just to show you this concept more in detail. So what we did here, we did a, a mini microarray. So we did a glass slide and we spotted probes for this micronase that have a very different GC content. This micronase almost doesn't have any GCs. This micronase has tons of GCs. And compare it uh, to an LNA uh, um, mini microarray. Then we spotted a, a mixture of 650 uh, synthetic micronase and see how the signal intensity of these mini microarrays was. What we found uh, when we only used DNA as a, as a, um, as a chemistry for, for these probes, that the, the signal that we obtained for these mini microarrays was completely dependent on the GC content. So this is completely as specific because this signal is high just because this GC content is high. When using an LNA normalized uh, uh, microarray, then we could detect all of them with fairly the same log signal intensity regardless of the GC content. So you can see here that the, the usefulness of this, of this uh, um, TM normalization is enormous uh, when detecting microRNAs. And so over the years, we actually developed uh, many products uh, for, uh, for uh, microRNAs in particular historically, but now we're moving, uh, since I would say a couple of years, uh, more into the, the broader RNA world. Um, and uh, we have, of course, uh, um, reagents for RNA isolation that do not involve uh, any LNAs. Uh, uh, we do <coughs> sequencing services, uh, and then uh, we have, uh, you know, expression platforms to detect micronase, and that's QPCR-based and microarray-based. As I showed you, uh, in situ hybridization uh, uh, probes based on LNAs, and these are actually the only ones that can be used for this type of application. So if you're looking to detect some micronase by in situ hybridization, just don't go anywhere else. <laughs> so you, you would be wasting your time. And then we have a series of tools for actually functionalizing the micronase that you identify uh, in, in, this, in this type of screenings here. So overexpressing, knocking down, et cetera, et cetera. So where are we at the Exigon Diagnostic now? So uh, we published uh, with some collaborators uh, recently a um, um, uh, kit that is uh, PCR-based. It's, uh, it's measuring a, a handful of micronase, but it's centered on this micronase, which is considered one of the the most well characterized oncogen oncogenic micronase um, so far. Um, so this is a kit that will allow you to uh, predict whether if you're a colorectal cancer patient, you will recur or not after treatment. And uh, we have actually this kit uh, uh, now in the market as a uh, IVD, so in vitro diagnostic kit 
for research use only though. So this is not clear uh, validated, so hospitals cannot use it yet, but we, we make it available to the clinicians out there uh, if they want to test it uh, uh, on the colorectal cancer cohort uh, to you know, increase the data and, uh, um, and the validation uh, status on this kit to eventually, we hope, uh, possibly next year, to have it as a, as a, as a first microRNA actually based diagnostic kit. Similar to that, uh, we have an, another research use only kit that is actually a early detection of a colorectal cancer that is based on biopsies instead. So basically based on a handful of microRNAs, including again microRNA 21, uh, this kit will tell you whether your uh, um, column biopsy contains tumor cells or not, and it has a sensitivity of a few cells. So it's a very, very early detection. But then what we are uh, really focusing uh, right now, uh, oops. it's programs that are biofluids based. So early detection of colorectal cancer based on circulating microRNAs, which I will describe briefly, early detection uh, um, and staging of prostate cancer based on urine microRNAs, which I will describe, and then we're trying, this is something very early, to actually translate all of this into next generation type of, of assays involving NAs, but this is a very early um, stage. We're also highly involved in uh, this international uh, consortium called the uh, HESI Committee, which involves, uh, you know, from the FDA to uh, leading pharma companies such as Bayer and GSK, and we've been appointed by them to actually define best practices for reliably measuring microRNAs in a toxicology setting for now, but we're expanding to other, other settings, in particular nephrotoxicity uh, so far. So we do our experiments, as I said, in our services department. Uh, this is uh, the largest uh, microRNA profiling uh, service lab in, in Europe, and uh, it's actually probably in the world uh, right now. We've done uh, many samples. Uh, uh, we have uh, customers from all over the world, uh, um, every continent. Uh, also, all the leading uh, pharma companies uh, use our services regularly for profiling microRNAs, and now all other RNAs using generation sequencing. We have several platforms, uh, many PhD uh, qualified scientists uh, we follow SOP, so like really amazing, amazing labs for, uh, for doing that. And what we have right now in this, in this last, uh, you know, less advanced programs that I described you as a, as a clinical sample, like clinical specimen, is, is plasma. And so plasma is a, is a great sample, as I said, because it's a, you know, minimal invasive, invasive collecting it. Uh, uh, it's uh, routinely available in every hospital, but it, of course, uh, it represents a lot of challenges when you're working with this type of sample. First of all, you know, out of 10 ml of blood, uh, um, you know, you get probably, if you do phycal separation, 5 to 6 ml of plasma, and the, the, the quantity of RNA that you get out of 5 to 6 ml is only 1 to 15 nanograms, so like very little RNA in there. And so, you know, when you're trying to detect microRNAs in this, uh, in this low RNA input uh, sample, then you face a lot of issues such as sensitivity, linearity of the assays. Uh, of course, if you lose even a little bit of RNA, you're done. And of course, reproducibility is, uh, is a lot of issues because, uh, you know, with such low expression, the noise is uh, much higher. And then, of course, uh, when you're trying to separate plasma, inevitably you will have some cellular contamination, and that's going to completely affect uh, your measurement. Because then what we, will you measure here, it's not the plasma microRNA, but it will be you know, cell-derived microRNAs. And these samples are usually dirty. Like, there's a lot of stuff circulating in, uh, in our blood, uh, and a lot of it is uh, also RNAs uh, and uh, PCR inhibitors, et cetera, et cetera. So what we, we've been focusing in the past at least three years is to bang our heads to try to find proper quality controls uh, for, for measuring reliably microRNAs on these type of samples. And this is something that in industry, really, you had to do really carefully. So you had to spend a lot of time in uh, you know, ensuring that your practices are actually the best possible. And so one of the first advantages that we have is that we have a, you know, a leading qPCR platform and so the issues with sensitivity and, and linearity and, and, and specificity are like diminished in, in, in a way. So our, our QPCR platform is basically um, composing two, two different steps. One is a, is a universal RT. So in your mixture, RNA mixture, you basically retrotranscribe all microRNAs that are present in there. And then once you have the cDNA, uh, which is, you know, all microRNAs are actually transcribed in 45 minutes or something like that. 
Then uh, there's a PCR step that is cyber green based and uh, um, it's based on these two micron specific uh, qPCR primers that we design and wet lab validate for each actually microRNA. So by using LNAs, actually, we are the only one that are able to design two primers that are specific for a molecule that is so short, like 20 nucleotides. You know, if you're uh, stuck with DNA only, uh, you can only design a primer that is as long as the microRNA and a reverse that is equal for, for every microRNA. So at least we can double the specificity by using LNA of, of this setting. And then another advantage of, uh, of course, using CyberGreen is that you can verify that you're actually amplifying something and you're amplifying only one amplicon. So we tested this, this platform in, uh, in various type of samples, uh, various type of settings, uh, super low input uh, RNA samples such as urine and CSF, uh, down to you know, cell, uh, cell culture type of RNA extracts, uh, and this, this platform is absolutely linear. And the confirmation, you know, uh, lots of companies will say, oh, our platform is the best. But, uh, you know, we actually been pleased because re recently uh, what we've been saying for years is actually uh, been acknowledged uh, by the market. So this publication came out last year um, comparing uh, all the uh, most well-known microRNA profiling platforms available um, from other uh, commercial vendors, including us put together people from each company and, and academic uh, people also. This, this was uh, coordinated by Joe in, uh, in uh, the University of Ghent in Belgium. And actually what this paper is showing that uh, our platform, because of LNAs in particular, it's actually the best performing platform when analyzing uh, microRNAs. And some of the key results of this publication were <coughs> that we have the highest call rate compared to the others. That means we can detect the highest number of microRNAs so the, the most sensitive that will be. And then uh, they measure um, uh, also specificity, uh, measuring families of microRNAs with, uh, with very little differences among family members. And this is, you know, this looks almost fake, but we actually we are the only ones not having any cross-reactivity with other family members, so absolute specificity. And that's because we have design flexibility. We can actually sit down and test the best primer for a given microRNA, because we can use LNAs and make, them, make primers shorter, uh, position the LNAs in, uh, in, uh, in uh, different positions until we find the best performing primer set. Also another interesting finding that came out is that uh, specificity is actually inversely correlated with sensitivity. So if you try to push an assay to make it more sensitive, then you're losing its specificity. But actually since we can, as I said, modulate um, and, and design flexible primer sets, we're actually the only one up here where we can be specific and flexible at the same time just by uh, modulating the LNA content and the length of these primers. And another important factor is that, uh, you know, the highest is this number, the highest is the accuracy of the platform. So compared to the others, we actually have the highest accuracy, and that means that when you're uh, profiling very low input RNA samples uh, over and over and over, then we, we, we were the ones that, we, that actually had the, uh, the highest reproducibility from sample to sample which was also, uh, also great. So we are well set with the, with the platform. So we, uh, we are confident, okay, we, we, we can do this uh, given our technology. Then, you know, we spent several months tackling the cellular contamination issue, uh, which is hemolysis. So in, in the circulation, actually, in a, in a given blood sample, 98% of the microRNA content is actually deriving from red blood cells lysing. So very little is actually independent floating around uh, in... Uh, in, in plasma, it's cell free. A lot of it is, 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 is red blood cells. So we did several experiments, you know, titrating uh, red blood cells, uh, uh, so spiking in red blood cells amounts in plasma pools. And what we found, uh, you know, the most reliable method actually of, of monitoring at least this, this cellular contamination, this is something that you inevitably will have in your sample, but it's nice to know whether your sample is heavily hemolyzed as opposed to, you know, very little. And so we found that the ratio between this microRNA that is actually red blood cell specific um, over this microRNA that is uh, actually completely independent from cellular contamination gives you a very nice estimation of whether your sample is, uh, is hemolyzed or not. And so what we also developed very recently is actually a quality control panel, qPCR panel, that you can use to pre-qualify your, your, uh, your uh, uh, sample. So instead of you know, going all the way in 
and do a huge screening uh, in plasma and then find it and your samples were, uh, were crappy, then uh, you can uh, first do this, which is you know, monitoring uh, RNA isolation efficiency, how your RT went, how your uh, PCR inhibitors are doing in your sample, qPCR efficiency, whether your sample is immolized or not. Uh, then you can see, okay, this sample is good enough, uh, then I can proceed to the next step of, of, of full profiling. And this is, for example, how um, RNA spikings are, are useful for this, for example. Um, so this is a sample in which, uh, during RNA isolation, you put a synthetic RNA in, and then later on, you qPCR this RNA uh, uh, synthetic, uh, synthetic RNA, and then you say, okay, the recovery was good, or the recovery was, uh, was bad, and that tells you whether your sample contains RNA inhibitors and PCR inhibitors. For example, this is a, a profile quite homogeneous, uh, so from, from this result you can say, okay, these samples look fine because these spike-ins have roughly the same value. But when you see this, you know, you actually start worrying about the sample and say, what is going on here? I'm losing CT values, so uh, these samples must be, uh, this sample in particular must be quite compromised. So this is a nice way of you know, pre-qualifying your samples uh, to that. So after you know, doing months and months of quality controls, we actually said, okay, well, we, we found a way that we can reliably profile micronase in, in this type of samples, which is serum or plasma. Let's start uh, doing something real. And so the first disease that we actually tackled was uh, colorectal cancer, simply because uh, it was a very widespread cancer. Uh, you probably know more than me about this. Uh, it's usually, unfortunately, detected at later stages, and uh, you know when you're detected with a later stage, because this is most likely, like most of the times, an asymptomatic type of cancer until you have symptoms, and then you're very late, and then the survival rate is, is very limited. Uh, treatment options are very limited, and so basically, our ideas was so we saw a market need for here. Uh, we saw okay, there's basically no way of detecting this cancer early. Uh, the only way is that you get a colonoscopy, but that's of course a very unpleasant method that nobody wants to have. Another uh, available um, method to try to diagnose this disease uh, is uh, FOBT, is a fetal cold blood test, but that's a, a very huge and, uh, and bad false negative rate, and then nobody really does it. So our thinking was, okay, if you have symptoms, of course, you gotta have a colonoscopy, because that's the only method that's, give you, that's giving you 100% of, uh, you know, uh, be sure that, that you're detected. But then, you know, if you're over 50, so you're a subject at risk, then you can go to the doctor, take some blood tests, use our kit, and that basically will tell you. If it's positive, then go have a colonoscopy to verify it. If it's negative, just come back the, the, the year after. It's doable, you know, it's just a blood test. Um, so what we did initially during the discovery phase, which is usually the first step that you do when you want to discover a new biomarker, we took 50 stage two colorectal cancer that were colonoscopy verified, 50 age and sex match a negative control. And we profile these this, uh, plasma samples using a, um, you know, what we call a mir non wide uh, qPCR uh, uh, screening method. Um, at the time, comprises 752 micronase. And then basically, using uh, you know, very, various statistical selection methods, uh, you know, we tested these samples uh, uh, many times in many different uh, combinations. Uh, also in a random fashion, uh, and what we found is actually that we could uh, identify in an unsupervised fashion, so meaning, uh, you know, we don't tell the software who's who, but the software was able, without knowing which, uh, which group these samples be belong to, was able to distinguish between colorectal cancer and normal patient, which was, you know, quite, pro quite promising, actually. And uh, uh, we selected, uh, you know, the candidates that looked the most promising, uh, several controls, we put them uh, in uh, replicates in the plate, and then we moved uh, this initial screening forward using 378 uh, uh, candidates. Uh, we went up to a, um, a second discovery set, so independent set of samples, and these were 325 samples at the time from, from many different uh, hospitals. We cleaned the data set, uh, taking out the samples that were hemolyzed, the samples that were uh, containing PCR inhibitors that, uh, based on the QC criteria that I described uh, were not uh, you know, optimal samples uh, as we would define them. And what we could see that again, this, this new set of samples uh, um, actually looked pretty good. So we could separate on a, this is a principal component analysis type of, uh, type of analysis, so kind of an unsupervised type of analysis as well. 
that is, uh, as you can see, uh, kind of nicely separating, although not, not perfectly separating, but pretty nicely separating the, the red uh, from the blue, which is normal uh, versus cancer. Without, uh, this is a rock curve, which is measuring uh, um, specificity and sensitivity of your, of your uh, separation was actually quite good, which is, um, you know, an AUC of 87 means 87%. So, you know, the, the ideal is 100%, but 87 is, is still pretty good. I believe that, uh, you know, to be considered acceptable on in vitro uh, diagnostic kit has to have at least 75%. So this, this was uh, above uh, the cutoff for being considered acceptable in the market also. So where we are right now, <sighs> This year, we're actually finishing up uh, 5,000 samples now, and the signature actually shrank um, down to, I think now it's, it's less than 15 micronase. So we've been weeding out uh, uh, all the different micronase. Uh, we're cleaning up the data set uh, more and more and more, uh, retrain the data set on the same data set, on different data sets. So a lot of work to you know, establish very stringent criteria on which micronase to move forward. And this publication hopefully will come out this, uh, this year, um, if not early next year, but we're, we're very, very close to, uh, to getting there. Another really interesting, more new project that we have is, is, is regarding prostate cancer in urine. So prostate cancer is another unmet need that we see because uh, simply the only um, uh, test for uh, um, trying to see whether you have it or not is, is the PSA. Uh, antigen, uh, which is completely as specific, is at, I think like 70% or more false negative uh, um, rate. So if you have high PSA, that doesn't really mean that you have cancer, but you still have to go to the doctor, and the doctor most likely is going to take a biopsy from your prostate of multiple, and that's, you know, going to hurt a lot, and then it's going to be like, okay, you didn't have anything, sorry about that. So really, a lot of people get over-treated for this. There's currently no way of detecting whether you really have prostate cancer or not, other than biopsy. And another issue with prostate cancer is that it rarely metastasizes, so a lot of people can actually live with it, and they die with the disease. Um, you know, so uh, another way is that, uh, you know, can we predict whether you're going to metastasize or not? Because if, you if you're not going to metastasize, we're just going to leave you with a, a kind of like a maintain, uh, maintenance treatment, and, you know, we're not going to have to remove your prostate, right? So... Again, huge market uh, need here. And so the test that we have in mind is quite simple, straightforward. Um, it's, you know, <coughs> you get a uh, urine test. Uh, now we're actually trying to see if, if we can get in the blood too. And the objective, of course, uh, reduce the false negative and false positive uh, rates. And what we want to do, is we want to tell you whether you have it and whether you're likely to progress or not. So whether you have an indolent disease or you have an aggressive disease. And so if you're having negative, just keep going to the doctor, keep doing the test until something, you know, progressive. If you have a borderline or aggressive, then, you know, you've got to stop. And what we are working on also is a more accurate, actually, biomarker on the biopsy. Also, that's another issue. Because also, you know, biopsies have false negative rates. And this is as of today. It sounds crazy. But, and then the disease, it's very hard to diagnose even from the most skilled pathologists. So... Another aim of this project in the long term is also to find, uh, you know, um, biopsy-based biomarkers. But for now, we'll focus on, uh, on uh, you know, finding on, uh, on urine, which is, you know, of course, anatomically linked to uh, very close to, to, the, uh, to the prostate. So, again, a urine sample is, uh, of course, a challenging sample. Uh, nothing is easy. Otherwise, uh, people would have done it uh, um, before. Uh, so Microne levels are even lower than plasma, uh, very, very little unless uh, you have uh, some sort of kidney uh, dysfunction. Uh, interestingly, kidney filters RNA. So we found that uh, patients that have uh, um, kidney failure, for example, so the kidney is not filtering anymore, they have tons of micronase in, uh, in urine, which is actually pretty interesting. But in a normal people, there's no, hardly any, any micronase in urine. And uh, there's a lot of inhibitors. So of course, you can imagine there's a pretty dirty sample. And again, here, lots of cellular contamination because urine, of course, uh, passes through lots of, uh, lots of department and you can get like, contamination with epithelial cells uh, and others. And then, of course, uh, uh, handling of these samples, uh, um, you know, uh, in particular with archivial samples when people didn't even know that you know, a biomarker could have been possible, uh, pretty challenging. So we're also trying to uh, find best practices on how to normalize these sample samples. 
And so this is the normal profile of, uh, of, uh, of urine in, uh, in, uh, in a healthy individual here. So like very high CT values. Um, uh, this is, uh, represents very few copies, very few molecules. And, and, and this is, for example, uh, um, urine treated with a nephro nephrotox. And you, and you can see that the, the content increases, but it's still quite low. Even lower is in cerebral spinal fluid, uh, I would say. It's another fluid that we are investigating for other projects. Uh, uh, very interesting as well. We can find micronase there, but very, very low content. So another issue, it's, uh, you know, these samples are very delicate. Uh, you know, freeze and thaw cycles, uh, you lose CT values as well. Actually, this is not the best figure, but I didn't have time to change it. it was, the scale is, is very bad. But if you focus up here, you can see that, you know, over various uh, CT, um, over various uh, freeze and thaw cycles, uh, actually you're losing CT values. It doesn't look much, but this is, you know, four or five times you're losing uh, content. So it's, it's a lot. And also if you leave it at room temperature for too long, then also you're losing, uh, you're losing sample. So what we try to actually, oh, there's a figure missing here. So, okay, well, so when we're trying to think, okay, we, re we really want to use this sample, so how we do it? So, screening the literature, we actually um, found that, um, why don't we look at actually um, what is really, uh, like, a, the, the sub-compartment sub in this biofluid. So, what is known as of today is that uh, micronases are not just freely circulating in the, in the circulation. So, as I said, it's full of RNAs, so they will be de degraded immediately. So they're protected somehow. So people think, and we also think, that micronase mostly are inside uh, this type of, uh, of uh, microvesicles. They're called uh, generally exosomes, um, uh, which are uh, vesicles that are actively secreted outside of the cell. They're probably used uh, for cell-cell contamination, although that's completely unclear as of today. It's not clear uh, what's the mechanism of release from cells to out. Uh, uh, really how cells uptake these exosomes, uh, and really why, and really what are the targets, what's the meaning, what's inside these exosomes. Uh. And another way micronase are is in, in protein complexes. So complex with proteins uh, in the circulation, they're protected that way. But we decided to look into exosomes because, uh, you know, we found that, uh, you know, it's also interesting from the biological point of view. And so we tested several kits out there to isolate exosome and methods and we couldn't find any that really satisfied us so uh, the way we usually do it is that then we develop it ourselves uh, so uh, we actually been working on developing a, a kit for uh, for isolation of exosomes i would call them exosomes but in reality it's it's micro vesicles because it's, it's not only exosome it's vesicles on, on many different sizes uh, but let's call them exosomes so, so what we did we developed this kit now it's, it's actually pretty good we tested on, uh, on uh, cell uh, release exosome, urine CSF, and also serum plasma. These kits are actually slightly different because, uh, you know, buffer conditions and stuff are, are different. Uh, but what we can see, this is a column-based kit, very simple, you know, less than one hour without doing fancy ultra centrifugation that lasts for days and stuff. You put in, this, in these uh, tubes, columns, and then you have a pretty nice uh, population of exosome. This is uh, measured by uh, an instrument that is called Nanosite. Um, it's a type of fluorescent-based uh, microscope that actually measure the size and number of microparticles that you have in an any given sample. And what a sample should look like should look like this: something that's centered around the 200 nanom nanometer size, which is the exon size. But as you can see, you know other sizes also are isolated, which, which might reflect in, in other uh, other vesicle types. And, you know, we can get a nice isolation uh, out of this. So we've done this in collaboration with another company in Denmark called, uh, called iNano. And actually, what we found, uh, um, we didn't want to compete uh, against ultra centrifugation, which is the gold standard for isolating exon. But actually, what we found is that we can even have a higher yield uh, than, than ultra centrifugation. Maybe because ultra centrifugation lasts for so long, there's a lot of manual steps, and maybe a lot of samples get simply lost uh, during, uh, during the procedure. Whether this is just a column base, as I said, less than one hour, you get it. So very nice method for, uh, for uh, and, and, and you can buy this, actually. Uh, very nice method for isolating uh, exosomes. So we tested on uh, challenging samples, such as urine and CSF. And we can see that, uh, you know, as opposed to um, 200 microliters of, uh, of urine, uh, you get basically nothing, no micronase detected by PCR. Enriching with exosome, boom, uh, all of a sudden you have a huge increase. 
And if you increase the volume, of course, uh, correspondingly, you have an increased amount of microRNA detected. Also, this is valid for CSF. Also, CSF samples contains almost no microRNAs, but simply because you can't detect it because it's so low. But then if you look at the exosome fraction, you can actually detect many, many more, uh, several log, log fold um, increase. So we thought that you know, uh, we were on the right track. And so then we ask, well, but then if you look at exosome, maybe we look at only a, fra a fraction of microRNAs, but we want to look at all of them. But actually, we found that the majority, at least in our hands, although this is still controversial in the literature, in our hands, actually, the vast majority of microRNAs isn't rich in exosomes. So the microRNAs that are in the circulation are actually inside these microvesicles. So most likely, they, they, they're actually transmitting genetic information from cell to cell. As you can see here, when we are rich for exosomes, we have several logs uh, increase in, uh, in enrichment uh, uh, in microRNA detectable as opposed to the exosome free fraction. And also, interestingly, uh, what we could find is that uh, serum contains more, uh, um, generally, more exosomes and more microRNAs and plasma. And that, that may be linked to the uh, coagulation process, which is uh, responsible for, uh, um, for, uh, for serum formation. And we saw a pretty nice uh, overlap between uh, uh, you know, the oxysomal fraction and, uh, and, and the whole uh, biofluid as such. Although some of the microRNAs are still outside of the exosomes, but you know, none are uh, you know, um, just in the supernatant. Um. So again, we applied the same uh, you know, classical biomarker discovery workflow for this project as well. So we set up to do a, a genome-wide screening, uh, so a microRNA-wide screening in this, uh, in this case, select a set of microRNAs to validate in an independent cohort, and then select it for a, an even wider cohort. And so just to close this part, uh, uh, this was a teaser. I can tell you much more uh, on an individual basis if you're interested. Uh, um, you know, we believe that we have a technology that is uh, absolutely uh, among the best uh, uh, to discover biomarkers in biofluids, so low RNA input samples, controlling sensitivities, and all the uh, uh, QC criteria that I described is, is sort of paramental importance. It's very important uh, um, just not to go to the false path. Uh, uh, we believe that exosome is key um, to um, uh, enrich uh, low uh, RNA samples. Uh, and actually, the kit that we have developed can be used in any clinical lab. So it's very easy to use. There's no fancy rocket science. And we believe that, of course, the circulating microRNAs and urinary, in this case, are, are, are very, very promising uh, biomarkers. Uh, very quickly, I'm going to switch gear um, um, to a completely different uh, story, uh, centered on the same, of course, uh, uh, focus. Uh, and this is an uh, um, um, antisense tool uh, um, against uh, um, small RNAs and any other type of RNA. So over the years, again, um, we are known, as, as Mauro said, for uh, um, being uh, leaders in, uh, in also functionalized uh, small RNAs. So again, this is a graph showing uh, um, the GC content uh, um, as a function of the, of the TM of, of, this is, again, whole human microRNAs. So very different. Uh, um, scenario we see here, uh, what's important to point out is that microRNAs that have a low GC content and therefore low TM, if you have only DNA to inhibit them, so to design a probe against them, you will inevitably design very poorly effective inhibitors. The way we, we've been around this, uh, and people have published in many uh, organisms, including humans, uh, what we do for these microRNA inhibitors, we modulate the, the TM content to make them uh, with very high TM and still very specific so that we can inhibit any microRNAs with very high affinity regardless of the sequence. And so we, we developed several uh, nice tricks uh, um, for modulating RNA molecules uh, based on our LNA chemistry. Um, inhibitors of microRNAs, if you want to inhibit them, uh, mimics, if you want to overexpress them, uh, then we have a uh, short molecules that we, ca we call target site blockers. So if you want to mask the bounding site of a microRNA uh, to the target uh, uh, messenger RNA, we can design oligos that block this site so the, this microRNA can't bind anymore to this, uh, to this target RNA, can't repress it anymore. So it's a nice way of validating uh, individual relationships between uh, you know, single microRNAs and, uh, and individual targets. But what I'm going to be focusing on uh, very quickly as I can is on what we are actually getting very, very excited uh, lately is uh, um, what we call GAPMIR. So these are antisense molecules based on LNA to target any type of RNAs. 
in the cell, not, not just small RNAs. And this, uh, we are applying this technology in particular right now because we are, uh, you know, very interested in non-coding RNA part of the, of the, of the, of the genome into long non-coding RNAs. So very briefly, what are long non-coding RNAs? These are um, non-coding transcripts, of course. They are longer than 200 nucleotides, uh, usually. And they comprise roughly, uh, this is according to the latest uh, ENCODE uh, uh, database, 40-50% of non-coding RNAs. But then if you think that, uh, you know, non-coding RNAs are actually 98% of the, of the transcript inside of any given cell. So in the past, people have been looking at, uh, you know, protein-coding genes, but that's only 2% of what is actually transcribed. 98% is actually non-coding. And 40-50% uh, of that is long non-coding RNAs. And the function of these long non-coding RNAs is actually largely unknown. I think that uh, less than 20 maybe long non-coding RNAs have been characterized so far. And here we're talking about tens of thousands that are out there that have been sequenced and nobody knows what they're doing. But they're abundant and they comprise most of the output of transcription in any given cell. So huge important molecules. What well, we know that they um, their expression is very tissue specific. They vary especially and with development. Uh, and again, they're very uh, linked to disease. Very interestingly, actually, they're very species specific as opposed to micronase. So this might even be, uh, you know, uh, responsible for, you know, why we're human and not mice. Uh, so very, very, very species specific. Most of them are nuclear retained. So they're transcribed and they're stuck in the nucleus. So they never leave the nucleus because they don't need to be translated anyways. And in fact, most of them have uh, functions that are related to nuclear architecture or uh, chromatin modification. Uh, um, uh, so the uh, nuclear functions, although also a lot of them uh, exit the nucleus and they, for example, bind to ribosomes and nobody knows why yet. And they've been, uh, you know, the few ones that have been uh, um, um, described, they're all linked, of course, with disease. So. Again, here is huge interest. But then, uh, you know, there's some issues with, the, with them also. And uh, one of the major issues is that uh, a lot of them, as I said, are nuclear retained. And so if you want to knock them down, you can't do it with sRNAs because sRNAs are only effective in the cytoplasm because they need dicer to, to cleave the target RNA. So if you have a nuclear retained RNA, there's no other ways with sRNAs to, to, to target them. Then they're very complex molecules. They have very tight secondary structure, uh, uh, many folding, because uh, uh, probably their function is, uh, since they don't code for a protein, it's probably structure guided function. So their secondary structure is important for their, uh, for their function, but it sucks because it's difficult to target them. So the way we, um, we do it is uh, we took out of the basket a very old concept, actually, like this antisense gap mirror type of approach uh, is older than siRNAs, but then it's been, uh, you know, overshadowed by the RNAi revolution. Uh, these people got, uh, you know, Greg uh, Fire Mello have a lot of attentions from the press. And so they said, okay, RNA interference is better than, uh, than antisense, uh, a classical antisense. Well, actually, we don't think so for, for a lot of uh, applications. So these, these molecules that we use are single-stranded as opposed to double-stranded like sRNAs. And so we think that, uh, you know, there's less uh, possible target effects due to the passenger strand uh, that sometimes is not degraded uh, fast efficiently enough. And then the mechanism is completely different. So once you transfect these oligos inside the cell, uh, they bind to complementary RNA target. And this RNA-DNA hybrid recruits an enzyme that is called RNase H, which is present both in the cytoplasm and in the nucleus, as I said. And basically, this RNase H cleaves uh, the RNA target. And then this oligo moves to another target. And the, the RNA that has been cleaved is, of course, uh, degraded by, uh, by uh, exonucleases. Uh, slowly but surely. Our gap mirrors are designed like this. So they're very short. Um, and being short is a huge advantage when you're actually working in vivo. Because uh, short molecules are actually uh, more efficient in being uptake, uh, uptaken in vivo. Um, then uh, we put uh, uh, lots of LNAs on the five prime and three prime end. And then uh, we leave a DNA gap in the center. That's why they're called gap mirrors also. And this is actually the DNA gap, uh, uh, gap is actually the RNAs H activating domain. So when it binds to complementary target, uh, LNA binding is so tight that RNAs H ca cannot cleave it. So it can only cleave here in the DNA gap. Uh, and it will cleave here. Then what we do, we stabilize them further with uh, this type of phosphorotide backbone, it's called, 
which uh, um, you know, prevents enzymatic degradation. So they're very, very stable molecules. And uh, their biostability is actually huge. Over the years, we tested hundreds of them uh, in collaborations mainly with, with pharma companies, because they can uh, help us also do it, because it's uh, very expensive to do it. And we developed actually an algorithm to predict the best possible designs for, for uh, any RNA molecule. And this is a nice algorithm because it's actually empirically based. So it's not something that we invented. It's actually based on the results that we had from screenings of hundreds of oligos. We extracted the data from there and, and developed this software. This is basically calculating hundreds of thousands of oligos for each RNA target that you input into it. And it's um, you know, taking into account several design parameters. Um, including TM, uh, if these oligos bind to each other, so it's have complementarity, how the gap is, uh, is if it's short or, or, or long, it's also another parameter. It looks for uh, access accessible region within, within the RNA, so you don't want to target here, you want to target more where, where the region is relaxed here. Of course, it takes into account the spiking pattern of this, this RNA, it's not just putting RNAs random, it's also like where you put it, of course. And then we actually expanded, this is actually pretty recent, uh, uh, we look for of target effects, but not only in the uh, splice transcriptome, which is, you know, all the RNA interference software, they only look at the splice transcriptome, but actually we found that uh, it's also important to look into introns, because this molecule can bind and cleave also introns. So the way we look at of target effects, it, it's, it's all the um, unspliced RNA. And actually this software, not as sophisticated as we have it in-house, but it's also available online. So you can actually go online if you're interested to, to try this alternative uh, method to, uh, to, for antisense uh, knockdown. You input your sequence and the software will find the best possible designs and you can buy them. Uh, simple, uh, as simple as it is. And we believe that these actual molecules are better for a lot of applications as opposed to sRNAs. As I said, because there's no passenger strand, so there's less of target potential of target effects. SRNAs have been shown uh, to sometimes uh, oversaturate risk, which is shared by the microRNA biogenesis pathway, and that you can create uh, some conflict between uh, the endogenous microRNA control and, and, uh, and your uh, um, effect, so it's not the cleanest effect. Sometimes uh, um, uh, SRNAs can have an, a microRNA-like effect, so they can bind uh, uh, uncomplementary to targets, and kind of like repress their translation. But the way these gap mirrors are designed, instead, uh, you know, the, the RNAs H activating domain is so small, it's usually 5 to 8 nucleotides that it's basically impossible to have a microRNA like effects. Also, having LNAs on the side. You can knock down uh, um, nuclear retained. Uh, we're focusing on long run coding RNAs, but it's actually any type of RNAs, something that you cannot do with, with, uh, with um, sRNAs. These oligos can actually enter the cell without even a transfection reagent, so a process called gymnosis, and there's some publication uh, out there. And there, what I'm gonna show you now, they're active in vivo actually without any formulation. So our interest in mainly, of course, is in using them in vivo as drugs. So one of the first, I think, few uh, sets of experiments that was very interesting, uh, interesting was done in collaboration with Rainer Boone, so, um, uh, we, with Stephanie Dimmler's lab in, in Germany. It's a lab that is uh, focusing, like Mauro is, in uh, cardiovascular disease and small RNAs. We asked them to test some of these uh, uh, this molecules for one of the long known coding RNAs they, 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 they were focusing on at the time. So we did, uh, we did 10 designs. Uh, uh, actually, here it's just shown nine uh, for them using this software. And they, this was actually an original software. So we actually have a newer version now. And what you can see that, um, you know, transfection, 48 hours in cells, the knockdown was actually pretty good for most of them, some of them really potent, um, uh, some of them less. They wanted to go in vivo, of course, so they said, okay, let's test it in, uh, uh, without a transfection reagent. So some people say that uh, this gymnosis or uh, uh, transfection-free method uh, reflects more an in vivo environment, because, of course, if you're trying to inject in vivo without any formulation, uh, you know, you uh, having a, a liposome or anything like that in vitro might be a confounding factor. Uh, so they tested without transfection reagents, and they could see that their best three oligos also worked without transfection reagent, which was pretty amazing. So this is just putting the oligo in the media, just wait, and then um, uh, do a qPCR for this target. And as you can see, reduction in uh, in all of them in a way or another. And that's this was uh, kind of like a. Um, uh, 
light opening uh, experiment for us. Uh, they injected these, uh, these uh, oligo naked, so no formulation, uh, stabilized as, as we do. They injected uh, uh, four different, uh, three different designs, uh, um, subcutaneous in mice, then they sacrificed the mice um, after uh, 48 hours, single injection, harvest some, uh, some uh, tissues, and they measured by qPCR this, this target, uh, long non coding RNA. And this was actually pretty amazing, because uh, you know, in the liver, of course, these oligos accumulate primarily in the liver. So in the liver, you see the most dramatic effect. So this is 48 hours after just an oligonucleotide that was injected sub-Q. You can see annihilation of the target uh, in, in the liver. Super amazing, but kind of expected. But what's actually unexpected was uh, that we could see effect in organs that are notoriously super tough to target with any type of drugs, a figure with RNA uh, antisense molecules, in particular the heart, which Mauro knows very well is, a, is an organ that for, for uh, RNA type of drugs is uh, very, very challenging to, uh, to reach. And actually you can see this publication that now came out uh, uh, last year um, on circulation research. Um, this is a new field that we're entering to. So these gap mirrors, are, it's, it's, it's somewhat a new field also for us. But a couple of months ago, another publication came out on cell using these gap mirrors against, against uh, um, like a target uh, that was uh, cancer related, uh, metastatic uh, uh, promoting uh, target uh, in vivo. And they could uh, uh, almost uh, um, annihilate uh, metastatic potential uh, of this type of cancer that they were studying, targeting along non coding RNAs. So, you know, and, and we know of more coming out. So we know that this is actually like hugely promising and this field is moving now uh, really, really fast. So just to finish uh, here, um, I think that, uh, you know, the non-coding RNA field represents a huge potential for finding novel biomarkers. It's simply thousands and thousands of targets there that are completely unexplored. And uh, we have the tools to actually uh, assess their function and, uh, uh, and, and detect them. Nuclear RNAs in particular, such a small at one, the, ones, uh, the one that I showed you right now, it's, uh, it's a very promising target because it's super sensitive to this type of technology. Uh, we think we have uh, uh, nailed it uh, in, in developing uh, uh, some potent uh, antisense molecules called gap mirrors that you can easily um, access through us. Uh, and these molecules, uh, this is the most important message that I want to uh, transmit, is that they can be used in vivo with no formulation. So, it's, so this, is, this could be a completely new avenue for, for, for drug discovery. Of course, as you can imagine, lots of people worked uh, for this. Uh, lots of my colleagues from, uh, from Exigon. Uh, we have uh, many collaborators, uh, also industrial collaborators. Uh, actually, I'm not going to mention all of them here, and there's also more. And our R&D is actually mainly funded uh, by, um, uh, by public grants, and uh, this work here is mainly funded by, um, by the Danish Advanced Technology Foundation, uh, which was a very, very generous uh, funding, which was actually renewed this year. So, and of course, all our collaborators uh, in Denmark. So I went over time. Thanks so much. Any questions, of course? <laughs>